the book of Mark. Today we're going to learn how to have a great dash. How to have a great dash. I've always been interested, and if you need a Bible, please raise your hand. We'll get you a Bible in your hands. I've always been interested in reading epitaphs at cemeteries. <laughs> kind of one of these, I don't know, some people say that's morbid. I don't know, I like it. I actually was at a uh, one from the Civil War back east a long time ago. And at one cemetery, there was a large tombstone, and a man's name was listed. Uh, and under his name, you know, the man's name, and then under his name was the date of his birth, right? And then on the other side, the date of his death. And then there was a dash right in the middle, and that represents his life. And right below it said, he was a great man. And I wonder, I wonder what criteria did they use to determine that this was a great man? The word great I, is probably the most overused word in the English language. If you look it up on Google, 5.5 billion uh, links to the word great or greatest or greater. And, you know, and that's part of the problem, too. You know, you have those three words, great, greater, greatest. I heard about a, um, a three restaurants that were on one city block, Chinese restaurants. You know how they go right next to each other? And the first restaurant had a large sign on it, really large sign that said, we are the greatest restaurant in the city. The second restaurant had a larger sign even than that and said, we are the greatest restaurant in the county. The third restaurant only had a little tiny sign, but it simply said, the greatest restaurant on this block. The word great can also be sarcastic, can it? Uh, if I went to the cafe down here, well, this would never happen, of course, but if I went down to the cafe and ordered a nice burrito and it comes piping hot and I sit down at the table and as I am after the sermon really hungry, I go and just whip into this thing and a bunch of gooey, white, sour cream comes running out of it, I would say, oh, this is great. Sarcastic, Right? And I, now that would never happen at this church because everybody knows I hate sour cream. But no, no wonder it's hard to learn English for people. There's so many different nuances like that. But I'm going to be talking about greatness today. And I want to illustrate greatness the same way that Jesus did. And I have a young lady that's going to come up forward. Hopi, come here, babe. Give Hope a hand, would you? Talk in the mic for me. Um, what's your name? Hope. Hope, okay. Hope. Everybody knows Hope, don't we? And um, hey, Hope, do you like coming to church? Yeah. What do you like about going to church? Game donuts. <laughs> Honest, yes. Do you love Jesus? Yeah. You do? Do you love me too? Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm kind of doing good. Can I have a kiss? Ah, all right. Give her a hand. Because when Jesus' disciples were arguing about who was the greatest among them, Jesus did exactly what I just did. He picked up a child in his arms and uh, ministered and touched this young uh, person in in verse 33, let's read together in chapter 9. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked him, what are you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, if anyone wants to be the first, he must be the very last in the servant of all. And he took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, 
Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we just, we struggle, Lord, with greatness and selfishness and those desires to be exalted in this life. None of us of us are without pride. And we thank you, Lord, that you've spoken so intensely on this subject. And Lord, more than that, your example speaks volumes. And so, Lord, we pray and we ask honestly from our hearts today, would you please, would you please instill in us, Lord, today through your word, that instruction in this area of our life to walk humbly before you and to live our dash, our dash, in a way that brings glory to you. And that truly is the greatest dash of all in Jesus' name. Everybody said? They were probably staying at Peter's house in Capernaum at this time. And apparently as they traveled <clears throat> from Mount Hermon down to Capernaum, there were times when Jesus wasn't necessarily walking right with the disciples because he had not overheard uh, this argument that they were having. But of course, he, he is God in the flesh. And so he's trying to draw them out about this, even though he did not he uh, hear the exact thing, but he knew what was going on nonetheless. And it says that he, he knew that they were arguing about something, but Jesus is trying to draw them out. And in verse 34, he says, but they kept quiet as Jesus asked them, hey, what were you guys talking about? They kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was greatest. Now think about this. What had they just seen? They had just seen Jesus up on the mount, three of them, that was Peter and James and John, were specifically chosen to go up on the mount on the Mount Hermon and in experience and see Jesus, the veil of his humanity removed for just a few minutes. And to gaze upon the glory of who he has eternally been and will be. And that is the son of God. In all of his power and glory. And then he saw also Elijah and Moses that, kid that appeared. And they were speaking to Jesus about his what? His departure, his death. Which is really, truly, that's what death is for the believer. It's a departure to go to be with the Lord. And so he was speaking to them about it. And then they stick their foot in their mouth. Of course, Peter is the one that says it. They're probably all thinking, it. Lord, it's good to be here. Lord, really good to be here. Hey, let's three build three little buildings here. Let's three little huts, three places where, you know, we could just hang out. One for Moses, one for Elijah. And Jesus, you get one too. And of course, then a voice came down from heaven, God the Father, and said, hey, not head. <laughs> Listen to my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then all of a sudden, Jesus came back to his usual, uh, the veil was removed. In, in, in other words, the, no, sorry, the veil came back upon him and his divinity was no longer apparent. Moses and Elijah um, went back to be with the Lord and the glory of the Lord was no longer there visually. And there was only Jesus right there. And he told them, and it was something that they needed to learn. But as they, he led them down off the mountaintop into the valley, of course, they ran right into trouble. We can't stay on the mountaintops. It's not going to happen. We would all like that. And that's what they wanted to do. But we needed to return down off the mountaintop into the valley because that's where the work of God is. It happens so often in struggle and through hardship and through, you know, uh, bouts of a lack of faith and going through that tearing up of that faith muscle that has to happen for us to grow in that way. Learning perseverance, all those problems that come into our life are being greatly used by God. 
but they came upon the rest of the disciples who had been trying to cast out a demon out of someone, and they were unable to. And so they went to Jesus when they saw him there, and they said, hey, why can't we do this? And why aren't we able to do this? And Jesus said, don't you know that this is by prayer that this demon will only come out by you be having a prayer life and asking God for his power and his presence to do that. And then instantly he commanded the devil to come out of that uh, boy and he was delivered and uh, they went on from there. But they had seen so much. And as soon as they get off that mountain and they see that the demon cast out, first thing they do is they're walking along as they start arguing about who's the greatest. And I can imagine that it might have been perhaps Peter and James and John, after they had seen this glorious uh, sight up on the mountain, they were the chosen few, that they may have come down with a kind of a big head and maybe have said, you know what, if we would have been here, we would have been able to cast that demon right on out. But you guys, you know, you're not part of the chosen few here. We're Jesus' favorites. And I can imagine that might have been the problem. We don't know what the actual occurrence was. But when Jesus said, hey, what have you guys been talking about? It says in the text that they kept quiet because they were embarrassed. They knew this discussion was off, way off base. And if we would have been there, we would have, you know, maybe we would have been in that same place. We would have just kept our mouths shut because we knew it was wrong. They had been with Jesus for two and a half years and they know it's out of line with his character. And so as they were walking about talking about uh, Jesus had just finished saying to them, you know what, how he would be betrayed and tortured and handed over in Jerusalem and that he would die and that he would raise again from the dead. And these were important topics, but instead of discussing these important topics, they're arguing about who's the better guy and who's the greatest in the kingdom. So when Jesus asked them what they were talking about, I don't blame them for being quiet, do you? They were embarrassed. And everything about Jesus was lowly. And we think about this. They had followed literally God in the flesh, right? According to John 1. God in the flesh. And yes, he appeared with so much humility that it would confound the world. And because outwardly there was nothing great about Jesus on the outside. He was born in a barn with the cattle and the smell and the filth and the flies. His birth was announced, yes, by the holy angels, but it wasn't to the important of the world. It was to the low-class shepherds out in the fields nearby this insignificant village named Bethlehem. Then he was reared and raised up in a bad neighborhood. People would say of it, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He grew up poor. And he owned no real estate. And what about his lineage of, his, of the Jewish Messiah? We see his lineage was anything but pure. He looked back in his lineage and there were two Gentiles in it. One, a Moabitess named Ruth. Another one, a prostitute named Rahab. And what was his chosen name? With the chosen name for the Messiah, wait till you hear this name, Yeshua, which was, it was like John Smith today, right? The most common name you could possibly have at the time. And the way he looked, we're told in scripture, there was nothing in his appearance that would attract us. He, he might have been homely. And he came with a very strange advance man, right? This guy, John the Baptist. And again, real common name, John the Baptist, munching down on some locusts dipped in honey. And uh, just a strange guy, right? And then he goes and picks his disciples, his what are going to be his apostles. And here are these 12 guys. They're a motley crew. <laughs> you know, several fishermen, which have a, a real reputation for not being the, the best of people, partiers kind of a thing, living hard and heavy. 
and a tax collector, which was the, the greatest thief that they knew of. And there was an anarchist even in there, a zealot that was trying to overturn the Roman government. And then you think about, you know, after that, as he went to his death, the way he died, it was a shameful death to go to the cross. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst of the worst. Matter of fact, he ended up dying with two men that were thieves and murderers and that deserved to be there. And you think about his teachings in his life and his example in his life of, of, of to be a servant, to not lord it over others, to lead by example, to be humble and be like a child and be as the younger and be the last and, and be willing to be the least. And none of those methods would ever coerce us to believe in him naturally. There was no smoke and mirrors in his approach. Because he wanted, and this is the reason why, he wanted no less than a genuine belief in him. And it's, this is indicative of what true love is. No smoke and mirrors, no, no facades. Jesus came as one that could relate to the common man. And he wanted to set us free and bless our lives and be able to make uh, us to make a genuine decision about him, not to trick us or to, or to outwardly influence us or to attract us with baubles and beads and shiny things. It's sad, really, what's happened in the church. That so often what we have in our approach to evangelism is nothing but bangles and beads rather than the word of God. Gail Irwin said in his book, The Jesus Style, he said, when that first cry was heard from the stable of Bethlehem into the care of Mary and Joseph came a wrinkled, blood-covered baby. The universe reached its turning point. For the first time, the God and creator who before had only heard, could only be heard, could now be seen and touched. In all that he was now occupied human flesh, approachable, available, vulnerable. And yet mankind prefers the unseen, distant God. We have difficulty with the God who is living flesh. We would rather wrestle with principles and dogmas and ideas than hear him call us to himself as a person. But God would not have it that way. Jesus, the dividing point of time, could be touched and he could put us in touch with God. Guys, one of the things that we need to see here, first of all, is that Jesus is telling us that we must resist the temptation of selfish pride. Of selfish pride. It is neither the example, nor the character, nor the witness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And these disciples were quiet because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. And so in verse 35, we see Jesus sits down, which was the position of the teacher in the Jewish, uh, you know, the Jewish way. The, the learners would all have to stand up. I kind of like that as a pastor. How about we do that? You guys stand up the whole service and I'll sit down. And he taught the 12 a radical truth about what they were arguing about. And he says in verse 35, if anyone wants to be the first, or be first, he must be the very last and servant of all. He's kind of cluing us in that we all have a problem, and that problem is the word I. I have the, an I problem, you have an I problem. And the essence of sin is always that I, that self-centeredness is at the base of all sin in our lives. The people, the person that suffers from selfish pride places their ego at the center of their own personal universe. And everything rotates around us and it revolves around us and, and what we want and what we feel. 
It's the me generation that we live in today. And most people don't know much about theology, but they know a lot about meology. And they like to talk about me. And what about me? What me likes? And I even have as well, sometimes I use the password, Mikey likes it. Because I, I, that's how what I remember the commercials from the 70s about somebody named, and he kind of looked like me, a little chubby kid. So I used to get really boiled when people would say, Mikey likes it. Look out for Mikey. But now I think it's pretty funny. And now we've got, you know, hey, think about this. We've got something that worked perfect. We can actually take the ability to take a picture at any moment in our life and, and put it online. And our favorite subject is, of course, ourselves, right? According to the CBS uh, report, we are taking 93 million selfies a day in America. But the Bible is teaching us that we must resist the temptation for self-promotion. The Bible says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider your others better than yourselves. And there's, there's nothing wrong with taking a selfie. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I know you guys all have selfies somewhere. And there's nothing wrong with having an honest ambition for your family to do well or your church, or your business too. That, that can be a good thing. But the Bible warns about the kind of selfish ambition that causes you to consider yourself better than others. You know, remember Crazy Horse, the, the old Indian chief from back a long time ago? When the tribal elders selected Crazy Horse, I'm told this is true, as the leader of his people, it brought him no riches. According to the historian Stephen E. Ambrose, to the contrary, he was expected to live modestly, as he did anyway. And he was to keep only those ponies he actually needed for the hunt or war or, and give away all the others. He was to distribute his meat to the helpless ones, especially the choicest cuts such as the tongue, or if you like that, or the hump, and we all like that one, the hump of the buffalo, saving the, own, the stringy leg muscle for himself. Isn't that interesting? The Indians figured that out. Their leaders should be servants. Well, I wonder how that would look in a president or in, in a government official in America. I wonder what that would look like. And so Jesus is saying, you know, he expects his disciples to be these kind of servant leaders. Not someone who thinks, uh, is trying to be the greatest, but they're actually learn, trying to be a servant of all. To be not just the first all the time, but to be the very last. Notice that word, very. And so in God's kingdom, service is better than status. Service is better than status. Jesus said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last in the servant of all. And so our, you know, it's a beautiful thing. You know, we think about, I think every pastor wants to have, you know, I think there's always a struggle with, well, how big is my church? And, you know, am I successful? And all that kind of stuff. And the only the only equivalent that Jesus has given us to determine whether we're doing well is to be faithful. There's never a determination of how big something is. And in the end, the, the greatest hope that we can possibly have in any ministry is that Jesus one day, would, when we go to be with him, would say, well done, good and faithful servant. And so, you know what, in this world, many are trying to make it to the top. And and into the top of the corporate ladder or to the top of the heap or the top uh, of being rich or whatever it may be. But God's kingdom is a reverse kingdom. In God's kingdom, the way up is down and the way down is up. To be first is last and to be last is first. James 4, 6 says, God opposes, opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 
few verses later in James 4.10, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will what? Lift you up. If you want to have a great dash one day, the way down is up and the way up is down in God's kingdom. And probably the greatest example that Jesus gave us and his disciples of the greatness of servanthood was when he washed their feet right before he was going to appear in Jerusalem and, and uh, offer himself, really, for man's sins. And after spending a day walking the dusty streets of Israel, you know, it was customary that uh, when you went into a, a house that your guests uh, would, before dinner have the, the lowest of the servants, the lowest one, the one that got the little, literally dirty jobs, right, would get your feet, your toes, and would come and, and uh, wash the feet and dry them off and make them clean. And, and that was customary to happen. But when Jesus gathered together uh, in the upper room for their last supper, nobody took care of washing the feet. Nobody thought about being that servant for the rest. So in John 13, 1, let's read this. It says, it was just before the Passover feast and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. So this is not, and I know some churches have taken this, like we have foot washing services and all this stuff. It, it, it's not meant to be something that we do and practice in the church in the literal sense. We, do, we have showers now. We have ways of taking care of that. We have shoes on, you know, not open-toe sandals. We have streets that are paved and not out in the... But what it is, is is something significant in a very spiritual matter that he's talking about, and he's saying there's something in this. I'm going to show them through this action what I have come to do for them in the world. And he was going to show them the full extent of his love. And the evening meal was being served. And the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so he got up from the next, uh, from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And so that he took off his clothing, speaking of symbolically what happened when he came, God the Son became flesh and dwelt among us. He took off the glory, the outward glory of his divinity and subjected it to being one of us. He didn't cease being God, but we, his glory was veiled in his flesh. And we're told in Philippians 2.5, <clears throat> your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality, to be, equality with God something to be greedily hung on to or grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And then it says back in John in verse 5, after that he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This speaks of the blood of Christ shed for our sins. That he would wash away our sins once and for all. The propitiation, the payment, the, the, the price that was required for our sins and not only ours, but the sins of the world was fully paid by his blood. And we were given the new covenant with God by the blood of Christ. In Philippians 2.8, it says, and found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Then back in John Verse six, it says, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not know now what I'm doing, 
but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Peter stumbled as he often would at the display of the, of the humbleness and the humility of Jesus who was the king of the Jews. He wanted him to be like the, the Davidic king to come and to overthrow Rome and to bring victory, you know, uh, in this world. But he just didn't, just didn't get it at first. That didn't seem to be in line with greatness to wash people's feet. He was stumbled over that. But Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter, Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean and you are clean, even though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not everyone was clean. And when he had finished, notice, washing his feet, he, their feet, rather, he put on his clothes. Again, speaking of divinity, as Jesus rose on the third day after his death, he went to be seated at the right hand of God. And all of his previous glory was given back to him. And he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. We're saying over, uh, over in Philippians 2.9, it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now we finish out this story. In verse 12, Jesus said, do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them, he said, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And here's a point that we need to consider today. In God's eyes, greatness isn't determined by how many servants you have but rather by how many people you serve. Are we on a quest, any of us? Are we on a quest, so to speak? Not that we're literal people serving us, but is that kind of the quest of success in our life? To be on the top rung, to make it there? There's nothing wrong with financial success. It really isn't unless it becomes something like this where we're desiring to be the top dog. We're competing and we're, we're in the world system just kind of trying to get the glory and feel like that's where real greatness is. That's where our dash is really improved with all of that. F.B. Meyer once said, he said, I used to think that God's gifts were on the shelves one above the other and that the taller we grew in Christian character, the easier we could reach them. But I now find that God's gifts are on shelves one beneath the other. It's not a question of growing taller, but of stooping lower. That we have to go down, always down, to get his best gifts. Jesus told his disciples in verse 17 of John 13, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You know, I was just thinking, I was just reading about a, a study at Duke University that says that you can lower your blood pressure and stress hormone le uh, levels and make yourself a great less risk for a heart attack by not interrupting people when they talk. Isn't that interesting? Serious. 
A Duke University study uh, found that people who interrupt are up to seven times more likely to get heart disease. And when subjects in another study focused on being silent and listening to others when they talked, they lowered their blood pressure and their stress hormone lesson, uh, levels. Can you imagine? And to listen to people, and the reason we don't listen to people and we interrupt to people is we don't value them above ourselves. We think that we have more to say. We're more important. We're somehow above them. And, and when we think highly of other people, we're interested in what they say, right? We regard them more uh, uh, better than ourselves in a sense or more important than ourselves. And we listen to them instead of interrupting with our own opinions all the time. And in God's kingdom, service is better than status. It doesn't matter if it's a big, you're some, uh, somebody in a big church or whatever it is. It has nothing to do with that. Are you a servant? We have to go through this all the time with our leadership to, to, to always refocus and keep focused on the, the fact that God's kingdom is an upside down triangle or pyramid, let's say. The world's success is, is like this. You, you try to get up, you know, at the base, you, you know, you're the, the one serving the next one up and the next one up all the way up to the very pinnacle. And, you know, to be that top dog, to be right up there, be the capstone of that pyramid is, is real success. But that's not what success is in the church. It's upside down. In the servant, the greatest servant, in the church should be the, the pastors in the church. They should be the ones that are servants, the lowest of the low. They should be the ones that are thinking of you rather than thinking of themselves. And we don't, we're not perfect. None of us are in that area. But that is what we achieve to, towards. And I'll tell you, God's, God's kingdom, and, and to have a great dash, service is better than status. And, and children have that unreserved love. That's why Jesus held up this child. You've got to become like one of, him, one of them. It's sad, but as we get older, you know, the more reserved we become in expressing our love. And us men are probably the worst about that. It's hard for tough men, you know, macho men to express love for their spouses, much less other men, right? We live in a time where, hey, you don't want to be heard telling another man, I love you. People might get the wrong idea, you know what I'm saying? But there are many of my guy friends, you know, man, I say, hey, man, love you, dude. But it's always dude. <laughs> love you, man, you know? You got to get the lingo down. And, and they'll say, yeah, so I'm like, hey, I love you too, dog. <laughs> oh, Chewy, you know, Chewy Lopez, you know, with him, I have a little bit different because, you know, he, he's used to, you know, homie, you know, hey, homie, Holmes, what's going on, Holmes? And so I heard this line, one liner. And, and so I don't, call, I don't call him Holmes. I say, I love you, Home Depot. And sometimes I'll call him, I'll just call him out, and he always knows it's me when I say, hey, Depot. And he turns, what? What do you want? What do you want? Try that sometime with him. He'll respond. <laughs> Man, this should be a place where we love. We love people. And it can be expressed in, in, in a safe environment. It should be a place where there's non-threatening hugs to be passed out freely. And we need to be more childlike in expressing our love for each other. Children have an uncomplicated trust, don't they? It, it, it's, it's so neat. You know, when it comes to Bible stories, you know, they just hear them and they enjoy them and they believe them very simply. For children, you know, the Christian life isn't some complicated problem that they need to figure out. It's just accepting God's love for them and trusting him. And I know a lot of people think that, well, a child can't really... Be, you know, they have to become adults before they can really make a serious decision uh, about the gospel. But that is, you know, Spurgeon was one to really be very much against that opinion because he himself had come to know the Lord three or four years old. And he says it was just as valid as anything else. But I'm going to tell you that Jesus said adults need to become more like children in order to become 
to be in his kingdom, not the other way around. And I heard something that supposedly happened in the CIA years ago. I, I don't know if it's true, but it's a great story. An agent, a CIA agent, was on an uh, a, um, a elevator, and he saw this piece of paper with a code on it. He thought it was a code. The slip of paper said K1, P2, C0, and K5. And he took it to the code breakers, and they tried to decipher it. And they worked and worked and worked, but they couldn't make any sense out of that code. And several days of attempts went by, and one of the older ladies who worked there for years at the CIA looked at it and said, that's simple. Those are knitting instructions. They mean knit one, pearl two, cast on eight, and knit five. Any of you that know that what that means? More power to you. I don't know what that means. But what I'm trying to say is there's no Bible code to have to crack. You just need to simply read it and believe it the way a child does. Read it and believe it. The entire life, uh, the, the entire life can be summarized in three commands of Jesus. He said, come unto me, didn't he? And that's salvation. Come unto him. He said, follow me. That's after salvation, that you would um, be his disciple. That's discipleship, just to follow Jesus in our life after we know the Lord. And then he said, remain or abide in me. And that's the spirit-filled life, that we would remain in him. And that's, that's really the whole thing. And so to have a great dash today in this world, man, is to become, learn to be a servant of all. Learn to be the last Learn to be the one that is willing to serve one another. There's a little poem I want to close about, about, about the dash. I'm going to close it with this little poem. I read of a reverend who stood to speak at the funeral of his friend. He referred to the dates on her tombstone from the beginning to the end. And he noted that the first came the date of her birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that she spent alive on earth. And now only those who loved her know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left you could be at dash mid-range. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we'd never loved before, if we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, Remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be pleased with the things they say about how you spent your dash? Jesus said that we must change and become like little children if we want to have a truly great dash. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Worship group can come on if you have a song. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness to us, your servanthood to us. Lord, we call you Lord and Savior, King, Master. And yet you served us in the most lowly, humiliating way. You identify with us, Lord, in all of our needs. And we thank you, Lord, for being humble. We thank you, Lord, for showing us yourself, your heart. And I thank you that right now, at this moment, there is nothing standing in the way of everyone here being able to know you 
and to have eternal life and to have their sins completely forgiven in their life forever and ever and ever. Because we have learned that all we need to do to reach God is lower ourselves, to humble ourselves. He's not way up high, too lofty to attain, but he is right here with us. If we will humble ourselves and ask him to forgive us our sin and Jesus to come into our lives and we receive him, he will give us eternal life and we will be given the the right to be called children of God. And as we pray right now, there may be some that would want to join in. But that's your heartfelt passion right now. It's not to just get some fire insurance so you can go back out and live the same way, but that you might experience a relationship with him. A life-giving relationship with Jesus. And if that's your desire, you might want to pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me and for coming to die for my sin. I come to you, Lord, saying I'm sorry. And I thank you that you do forgive me and that you're willing to come into my life and be my Savior and be my Lord. And all I have to do is just get off the throne of my life and let you be on the throne. Lord, I don't know how it's all going to work out. I don't know how my life can be turned around by you, but I'm willing for you to do the impossible. Come into my life, Jesus, please. Forgive me. Help me. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. God bless you. We're going to sing the last song. Would everybody sing?